Good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We're so very glad that you're here to worship with us today, learn about uh, what God has laid on Pastor Josh's heart. Happy Father's Day today. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day, Grandpa, and to all of you dads out there. Hope you have a great day today. Why don't you stand with us as we sing and praise the name of Jesus. This is my Father's word, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's word. gather here together to worship you. Thank you for what fathers mean to us. Uh, and thank you for what you mean to us as our Heavenly Father, uh, giving, sacrificing your Son on the cross. Lord, we love you. Uh, help us to glorify and honor you in all we do and say in your name. Amen. For the beginning of time, no point of reference spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as 
as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath and its form If the stars were made to worship, so will I I can see your heart and everything you made Every burning star, a signal fire of praise. Creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise.
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Church of Phoenix. Whether you're here in person or watching online, we're glad that you're with us today. Uh, just a couple announcements. Our baby bottle drive is ending today. So hopefully you remembered if you took a baby bottle home, you can bring it. That goes to Choices Pregnancy Center, and you can turn that in today. Or for your convenience, everything is done online these days. The instructions are in the bulletin. You could also donate to Crisis or Choices Pregnancy Center online. You can do that automatically. But today is the last day, although if you bring it next week, we'll make sure it gets there too. So, uh, but if you came prepared to give today, that's wonderful. Also, if you notice in the bulletin, I, I hate to start thinking about fall because then we're going to get disappointed, but we already have some events for you to look forward to in the fall. Women, there is a fall retreat. It'll be in October, so make sure you're planning on that. Write that down on your calendar. And camp is just a month away. Camp is coming this year. We're going to do it. It's just a month away. You can register online, and um, kids do that. If you have any questions, talk to Pastor Mike about that. But we have also a wrap-up of our Vacation Bible School that we just had this last week. So Hannah Hodgson, come on up. Hannah, our new children's ministry director. Um, this church was filled with kids Sunday through Thursday. It's really great to see that, and all the air conditioners worked perfectly. So that was really important this last week. But Hannah, tell us what happened. All right, good morning. I'm so excited to share with you that we had a wonderful week at Vacation Bible School. We averaged about 60 kids each night, which was awesome. And we had a really great group of volunteers who showed up, prepared, and poured into our kids all week long. Um, so thank you to all of our volunteers. Thank you if you donated items. Thank you if you helped decorate. Um, we really had a great time this year. We've got a little uh, video to show you what it was like. in heaven for me. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This is made a place in heaven for me. Bring it down. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. Jesus made a place in heaven for me. This train is bound for glory. This train. in heaven for me. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train. This train. This train. Today we live
There we go. That, so adults, doesn't that make you want to become a kid? Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> go back in time. Uh, Nathan Kincaid did a great job putting that together. In fact, Nathan would take pictures all throughout the Vacation Bible School, and that night he would show these videos to the kids, so um, he did a really good job with that. Uh, that's it for announcements. Make sure that you look through the bulletin and see if there's anything else in there. And at this time, what I'll do is I'll pray. I'll pray for the offering, and then we will dismiss the kids to follow Miss Teresa out for Children's Church. Let's pray. Lord, just looking at the video um, of our Vacation Bible School, it just is a, a wonderful reminder of, of why we exist. You have given us this amazing gospel of grace, and you want us to share it with the world. And the fact that we could do this with our kids this last week, what a blessing and what a privilege. And we pray that it'll just make a, an eternal impact on those kids' lives, and not just the kids, but also the, the leaders that pour their hearts and their minds into these kids all week long. But thank you for calling us to such a wonderful ministry opportunity, and we look forward to that and many more in the years to come. And Lord, bless those who have come prepared today to give so that our ministry can continue to move forward and, and make an impact. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, kids, up to third grade, you can follow Miss Teresa out for Children's Church and Dan as well. <laughs> well, Father's Day today, I'm sure everybody knew that. Don't know if you have any plans today, but something, something important is happening at 1230 today, something like that. You, and you're going to watch the Suns game today? If you love Jesus, you will watch the Suns. <clears throat> well, with this being Father's Day, I feel obligated to tell some dad jokes. You ready for some dad jokes? There we go. In fact, I was looking at Zach. Zach Short is now a new dad, and I think that's one of the reasons why he wanted to become a dad, so he can start t telling dad jokes. Isn't that right, Zach? Yes, he's, he's going he's gonna to fall in the fold. So here we go. A few dad jokes for you. And when it comes to dad jokes, you know that's where the magic happens. Jokes and dad, you got to love that. Anyway, okay, I got a few for you. All right? What is brown and sticky? A stick. These are, I told you these are dad jokes. I didn't say they're funny. All right, dad joke. Okay, another one. Okay, here we go. How do you get a country girl's attention? A tractor. <laughs> oh, you guys like that one. Okay. You never know which ones are going to go over well and, and not. Okay, how about this one? What do you call a pudgy psychic? A four-chin teller. <laughs> right, like that one. Okay, a couple more, a couple more. We won't do this all day. Some of you are kind of getting this. Dads, you guys, your, your intelligence is so high, you should get this right away. All right, here we go. Want to know why nurses like red crayons? Because sometimes they have to draw blood. <laughs> Couple more. Uh, my kids are like, Dad, stop. This is horrible. Just wait. You guys wait. Someday you're going to love to do this. All right. Another one. Sundays are always a little sad. But the day before is a sadder day. Uh, there's the moans. There's the moans. Okay. Last dad joke. Here it is. Okay. When does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes a parent. <laughs> Some of you like that. Okay, enough of the dad jokes. Now, I have, I have two more, but they're not dad jokes. I got one more joke. This is Matt Braze. He told me this. He said this is his favorite joke, and I love this. I can't stop laughing when I think about this. So there's two muffins in an oven. And one muffin turns to the other and says, man, it's hot in here. And the other muffin says, ah, talking muffin! <laughs> Angie's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe. Okay, here's the last one. Now, this is a joke that's transitioning into the sermon, okay? Now we're going to get serious. But this is a dad joke. It's not a dad joke, but it's a joke about dads and all little boys you can appreciate having probably done something like this in your lifetime. So one day there were three boys on the school bus, Bart, Buddy, and Chuck. And Bart started the time-honored game of parental one-upmanship. And Bart said... My dad is so fast that he can throw a 120-mile fastball, run down from the pitcher's mound, pick up a bat, and hit a home run. And, and Buddy said, that's nothing. My dad can shoot a rifle, run down downfield, pick up the, the, the target, and have it, hit a bullseye. And Chuck said, that's nothing. Your dads don't even come close to being fast as mine. My dad is a school teacher. And even though he gets off work every day at 4 o'clock, he's home by 3.30. <laughs> I 
I know it might be hard for many of you to remember what it was like to kind of go through that stage where you wanted your dad to be the best dad, and then eventually you grew up and you realize that he's not. But sometimes little kids, they go through that stage where they think, my dad's the best, he's the fastest, strongest, smartest, or whatever it is, and that is a short, brief stage of life. But with this being Father's Day, what I want to do is I want to start today a brief series on our Father, our Father, God, who is in heaven. And I'm calling it What We Should Know About Dad, What You and I Should Know About Our Heavenly Father. And what I'm using kind of as inspiration, and we'll look at certain passages in this, is we're looking at Jesus' prayer to the Father from John chapter 17. And I've always wanted to do a sermon series on this chapter because there is no other chapter in the Bible that is quite like this. And what I'm doing is, kind of in my preparation, I'm using a book written by an old pastor that's passed away, but he was a very famous preacher in England. His name is Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I'm reading his commentary. And at the very beginning of this, talking about John chapter 17, he said something that really struck me as very important, and so I'm going to share what he said with you, and I'm actually putting this quote up on the screen. But he said this about the importance of John chapter 17 and what we learn about the Father through the Son's prayer about the Father. And he says this about all the promises that we have that we find in John chapter 17. And Dr. Pastor Martin Lloyd-Jones says, Half our troubles are due to the fact that we fail to realize what is exactly offered in the Scriptures. All of our anxieties and troubles, all of our uncertainties and hesitations, and so much of our unhappiness in our spiritual lives is to be traced simply to the fact that we do not realize what is provided for us. Our life is dictated and determined by our understanding of God the Father and what he has promised for us. And I believe that this statement is accurate. He said this probably maybe a hundred years ago, and it's still true today. I know from personal experience, I'm sure you can relate to this, if I'm focused on problems that are out there in the world, I easily get a sense of hopelessness. Like, how is this problem going to fix itself? How, how are we going to solve these issues? But when I'm focused on God and the promises that I know that we have in God, I have what the Bible tells me I'm going to have. I have a peace that passes understanding. This is what we get when we understand the Father, and what he has promised us. And so our Father has given us everything that we need in this life to thrive and to fulfill his will. I love what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. I love what Peter says here. He says that everything that we need to get through life is found in our knowledge of God. And when we know God, We will know God's power is available to us in every area of our lives. And it's great that Peter says this because Peter learned this from Jesus Christ. And Jesus knew the truth about the Father, and so Peter learned directly from Jesus. And so here in John chapter 17, we're going to spend a few weeks here, but Jesus is praying for us to know God. That's his prayer, that we will know God, what God has done for us, and what he will do for us. And if there's another chapter in the Bible that is as important as John 17, I I don't know what that would be, but this would be one of the most important chapters, I think, in all of Scripture. Now, before we get into it, in fact, today I'm not going to read through the chapter today. We're going to look at one verse today. We'll get into more of it in the the weeks to come. But I want to give you a little bit of background on chapter 17 of John so we can understand the significance and the importance of what Jesus' prayer is to the Father. So I want you to consider John 17 and understand that this is at the very end of Jesus' public ministry. This is literally the last thing that he said that is really recorded in in any amount of substance before he died on the cross, okay? This is what he last says. Also, um, when, when he says this, 
He is praying with wisdom to the Father for the benefit of the disciples. He wanted the disciples to hear this prayer so that they would hear it, they would remember it, and most importantly, that John would someday record it so that you and I would know what Jesus said to the Father before he passed away. And so this here in John 17 is essentially Jesus' last words. If you knew that this week would be your final week on earth in this body, what would you say to your family and friends? You would probably tell them the most important thing that you could think of. Well, this is what Jesus is doing here in John chapter 17. Jesus is praying that we will know God and what our spiritual position is in him. But it's also good to know what leads up to John chapter 17. So let me give you a little bit of background on this. I'm going to spend, now, I hesitate to say this because I never know how long I'm going to go with this. I'm planning to spend about four or five weeks on John chapter 17, unless I get inspired to go longer. And I encourage you to read this. Read John 17. Read it once this week. Read it once a day this week. You know, you read it as many times as you can. But I also want you to consider reading from beginning in chapter 12 all the way through 17 or the rest of the book of John. Because what happens is in John chapter 12, for the rest of the book, that is the last week of Jesus' life. So John chapter 12 through the rest of the book of John is one week's time. I want to read some select portions of this so you can kind of get a sense of this. So John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, it says, six days before the Passover, and when did Jesus die? When was he crucified? On the Passover. Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. So John chapter 12 begins the last week of Christ's ministry and life here on earth. Then you fast forward to John 12, 12, and then we get to the next day, which would have been what we call Palm Sunday or Lamb Selection Sunday. So John 12, 12 says, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast, the Passover feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And then we get to chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. And these four chapters are what Jesus said to the disciples during the Passover meal. Okay? So these four chapters are what Jesus tells them during the Passover meal. And John 17 is the prayer, the conclusion. Um, I want to look at, I want to see, uh, I want you to see in John chapter 13 what he says here. So this begins these four chapters of Jesus' discussion with them during the Last Supper. John 13, 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper... He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So I don't know if you knew all this, but 13, 14, 15, and 16, this is what Jesus is doing during this last supper. And then we get up to eventually to chapter 18, and that's where Jesus went off into the Garden of Gethsemane. So I'm going to skip this this one. I'm going to go to the next one. But here in John chapter 17, this is what he prays to the Father before he leaves to the garden, because in John 18 it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And that's where he was betrayed and arrested. So here we have John 17. And that's what we're going to be spending some time focused on. And John 17 is broken up like this. Verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. Verses 6 through 19, he prays for the disciples. And then verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays for all future followers of Christ. So we find ourselves there, Jesus is praying for us in 20 through 26. And what we learn about the Father from the Son makes this one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. And so for this series, what I'm planning to do, 
at least at this point, is to highlight five truths about God the Father in this prayer. And they're not necessarily going to be in any specific order. Sometimes we'll look at a section, sometimes we'll look at a verse, just one verse like we're going to do today. But I want to start with one of the last things that Jesus said, because if we don't start with that, then everything else that he says really won't matter. And the truth that I want us to look at today about our Father is this. This is what we learn from the Son. We learn that our Father is faithful. Our Father is faithful to us. And this is what Jesus prays in John 17, 25. He's concluding his prayer and he says, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. It's very important for us to understand what he meant by saying, O righteous Father. Jesus is referring to the Father's character, his righteousness, that he will always do what is right, which makes him, for us, faithful. And as Jesus is praying this to the Father, it's kind of like he's saying, I know what you have promised that you are, what you have promised to perform, and I know that you will do it, Father, because you are righteous. And you have made certain promises to me about those that you have given to me, and I am expecting you and asking you, Father, to fulfill those things. And I want you to think about this prayer from Christ's personal perspective. At this point, Jesus has almost fulfilled all of his earthly ministry, and there's one last thing that he has to do. He needs to die on the cross for our sins, and now Jesus is committing himself and praying to God the Father, I am trusting you to fulfill what you have promised to do which is to raise him from the dead. And if you look at all the things that Jesus did in his ministry, he humbled himself, he became a man, he became the perfect example for us. He taught the disciples how to make disciples, who would then make disciples until we get to the year 2021. And now he's about to take this final step and fulfill what is written about him. And he says, Father, now it's your turn. You need to do what you said you would do. And if God is not faithful then all the things that Jesus had done up to that point would be worth nothing. And so for us, when we apply to our lives from Jesus' prayer here, is that God is and will be faithful to do what he promises to do. You know, fathers, we hear Father's Day, and fathers, if you're a father, if you had a father, you know that dads like to make promises. Or maybe we say promises and maybe we just make our intentions known. But we all know, and especially if you're dad, if you tell your kids that you're going to do something, sometimes you might not have the actual control or power to do it. You're just saying, this is what I am intending to do. But I know that whenever I say something to my kids, I want them to say, I know my dad is going to do what he says that he's going to do, as long as it's within his power to do it. But ultimately, there's only one person who can actually do every time what he promises to do, and that is God the Father. All the rest of us, We try our best to do what we say we're going to do, or we lie, but God the Father is able to do that. And we kind of go through this every election cycle, don't we? You know, don't get fooled by all the politicians. They get up there and say, I'm going to promise to do this, and either they're lying, they don't intend to keep their promises, or they don't have the power to keep their promises, or their promises are dependent upon other people actually agreeing with it. So in politics, to fulfill a promise, it's, it's rather complicated. But with God, it is not. God has all power and authority. And nothing else in this life can give us the assurances that our Father can. And so this morning, what I want to do is look at two ways that God is faithful to us. There's obviously more, but for this morning, I just want to look at two ways in which God is faithful to us. And the first way is this. God is faithful to provide. God will provide for our every need. And we learn about this in many places in Scripture, but I want to focus on Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. So the author of Hebrews says, Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, there's that nasty C word again, contentment. You know, we talked about contentment a few weeks ago, and I was shocked at how many of you made comments on your own contentment or lack of contentment. I I admitted to you that I struggle with contentment. I think we all struggle with this. 
But I don't think it's any coincidence that here in Hebrews chapter 13, the author of Hebrews links money with our trust in God to provide. Because if there's anything that you and I replace our trust in God with, it's money. We think, if I have enough money, I can solve all my problems. I don't need God. And that's why when you see wealthy people, they have no sense, there's no real actual sense that they need God for anything. They think that their money will handle all their problems. Well, I got a question for everyone here today. Have you personally in your own life seen how God provides for all of your needs? And if you're sitting here and you're saying, yeah, I have, I bet that in some way your handling of your finances is a lesson that you've learned that God wants you to learn when it comes to trusting in him. And one of the reasons why God asks us to give to him is because it is a way for us to have God show us that he will provide and also for us to have a way to actually put our faith in him and to do what he promises us to do. In fact, God tells us to test him with this. He says, test me in this way and I will prove to you that I am faithful. And there's a really great example from the Old Testament. We're going to look at this in just a second. As you know, God had a special relationship with Israel. One of the things that he gave to Israel was the law. Lots of rules and regulations and commandments. And one of those commandments that he gave to Israel was to tithe. And that was to give a 10, 10% of their produce or their offering. And God was asking them to do this, not because he needed it, but because he wanted them to trust him. Well, as you see through Israel's history, they didn't always follow God's commandments. And there was a time when they were, they turned their back on God, and God says to this about his ability to provide for them in Malachi 3, verses 6 through 12. So Malachi 3, 6 through 12, God says to the nation of Israel, For I, the Lord, do not change. He is immutable. He is faithful. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Now, the reason why you're saying this is you have not been faithful to me. You have wandered away from me, but I am faithful to my, your forefathers. That's why I have not consumed you. Verse 7. For the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And it's very interesting what God says to them about the way that they return back to him. Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And then he says this. This is his promise to them. Verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there will may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And so God says to them, you don't trust me. You're putting your faith in yourself. And so he says, Test me in this, and I will show you that I will provide. Do this. Put your faith in me. I will show you my awesome power and love. And the good news is, you and I today, we are not under the law. We are in this age of grace, and we are told in 2 Corinthians that it's up to us that we decide how much we will give back to God. But what God is trying to accomplish today is the same thing that he was trying to accomplish back then. It's about trust. He wants us to trust him that he will provide. So I ask this question, and you think you know the answer, but do you really believe this? Do you really believe that God is faithful to provide everything that you need? And if you say yes, one way that we act on God's faithfulness, on our faith in God's faithfulness, is through our giving. And if you're here today and you've never learned this lesson, and if you're not giving I ask you to put God to the test. He's asking you. I'm not. Put God to the test. He will show you that he is faithful. This is God's promise to you, not mine. God will do this. And so God, Jesus calls God the Father righteous because he is faithful towards us in providing. That's the first point. 
And the second point about God's faithfulness is this. Not only is God able to provide for us, but God is faithful to save us. God is faithful to save. Now, when Jesus was praying this prayer in John chapter 17, he knew what was about to happen. And he was fully human, so he was experiencing stress and anxiety and fear. He knew that he was about to face the full wrath of God. But do you think that Jesus, in his full humanity, had any doubt that God would raise him back from the grave? I am going to say, no, I don't think he had any doubt because he knew the Father. He knew God had the power to raise him from the dead, and he knew that God had the desire to raise him from the dead. And many times in scriptures, God makes this same promise to us. Our salvation is not up to us. It is fully dependent upon the Father. Our Father has the power to grant us eternal life, and he has the desire to grant us eternal life. And all we get to do is accept this by faith, that God's gracious love and mercy will grant us eternal life. Well, let's read about God's faithfulness to save us. I always like what God, G, John says in 1 John 5, 13. Now remember, this is the same John who wrote John, the book of John, in John 17. He saw Jesus pray this prayer to God the Father. John saw Jesus die, and God, John saw God raise him from the dead. So that's why he's able to write what he says here, John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm writing this so that you can know, not just hope, but that you can know that you have eternal life. And from John's perspective, he saw that Jesus had faith in the Father to raise him from the dead. And so now John can say with confidence, I know that you can know that you can have eternal life in Christ. Paul also gives us this confidence as well, this assurance that we need regarding our salvation. And he reminds us many times about God's faithfulness when it comes to our salvation. Let's look at a couple of those right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Paul's writing to the Corinthians and he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, in these couple verses, Paul says that God does a lot of things for them. It says that who supplies the gift that they need? God does. Who will make happen the revealing of Jesus Christ someday? The Father will do that. And who is going to sustain them until that day? The Father is the one who sustains them. And as we look at 1 Corinthians and all these other passages, we realize there's nothing about our salvation that is up to us and our power and our ability to do it. This is all based on God, his power, and most importantly, God's faithfulness. God is faithful to save. One last one in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. I love this one. He's basically repeating what he says in 1 Corinthians. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Remember we talked about sanctification a couple weeks ago? To sanctify someone is to separate them from sin, set them apart, make them holy. So God is the one who's doing this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do this. Listen, there is coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to return for us, and we are told in that moment on that day, we will stand before him pure and blameless. And the reason for that is, God is faithful. He will do this. This is not something that we are doing for ourselves. He is doing this. And this kind of touches on the topic of eternal security, which is one of my favorite subjects in all of Scripture. A very important subject. And Jesus talks about this in his prayer, and this is one of the subjects that we will look at during this series but we need to be clear about our salvation. 
It is all based on God's grace, his mercy, and his faithfulness to complete it. He will do what he promises, just like he did with Jesus Christ. Well, today, I'm sure all of you have a lot on your mind, especially you dads. You're thinking about all those barbecue tools that you probably got to cook some burgers today or whatever you're doing. But I wonder how many of you, how many of you needed to be reminded of God's faithfulness to you this morning? I did. I think I, think need, I need to be reminded of this um, pretty much every day. But this is who our Father is. He is faithful. He will do what he promises to do. You know, in life, we have a lot of things that we hope for. Like, I am hoping today that the Suns are going to win. I think hopefully you are too. Win, this, win the Western Conference Finals, go to the ch championship game, and, and, and win that as well. But listen, as some of you are celebrating Father's Day today, remember, here on earth, we do not have perfect earthly fathers. In fact, some of you may have not had a good father at all. Maybe a, an actual a horrible father. Some fathers are horrible. But we learn that our Heavenly Father is perfect. And so it's in Him that we are needing to put our hope and trust. Well, I do encourage you to read through John chapter 17 this week. Once a day, once this week, whenever you want to do. But I hope that all of us as we go through this series will truly enjoy learning about our Heavenly Father in this prayer by the Son. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this prayer in John chapter 17. And as we spend the next few weeks looking at this, I pray that the insight and the wisdom that we can glean from this chapter will make a, a huge difference in our lives. Just like Peter says, you inspired Peter to write that your power gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And when we understand you and we know you and the promises that you've made to us, it allows us to thrive. It allows us to act boldly with confidence knowing that our future is secure because you are a faithful God. So Father, today, right now, I pray for all the fathers. Thank you for putting fathers into our lives. I pray that you'll give the fathers that are with us today, here today, watching online, part of our church family, that you will enable them to be the best earthly father possible through your power. But Lord, thank you for being our eternal father that will never let us down, that will never disappoint us, and that in every single way possible, you will be faithful to us. And for that, we praise you this morning. We pray this in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I know many of you probably expect that we would sing Good, Good Father in closing. But that would be a little cliche. So if you'll stand with us and sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away. Sons of glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice. my room.